Okay, good morning, please. I uh, hope you had a great night and uh, a wonderful rest of time. Okay, uh, it's a great and a sunny morning here uh, in my in my office. So um, I'm so I'm quite grateful. Many of you also had the time to connect, even despite the short notice of the time change. And uh, I'm grateful for that. Okay, hope we were able to follow through yesterday's lecture. It was just a brief lecture, and today would also be brief. Uh, I'm hoping I'm not. I'm hoping that we may not be more than an hour, an hour thirty minutes. But um, uh, I'm glad you're you're, in a, you're healthy and strong. Okay, so we started yesterday with uh, the stomach, and um, and uh, we went as far as looking at. Um, uh, the phases of gastric acid secretion. We had looked at the, the physiological anatomy of the stomach. We looked at the gastric mucosa. We looked at the innervation of the stomach. Then we we looked at the phases of gastric acid secretion. Then we mentioned also we looked at uh, the gastric factors that affect gastric secretion. Then we looked at uh, the gastric juice. We also looked at the mechanisms of protection of the gastric mucosa. And also, please, when you hear get this subheadings, it's beautiful that you also, okay, the subheadings as I'm mentioning them, you can also find a few material to, to patch up with the ones you, the ones I'm giving you, okay? So that's, that's so awesome, okay? And uh, uh, the assignment I gave you, I don't know if the deadline is passed, but please make sure that when you write in a reference, make sure that the reference is uh, appropriate to the, is actually what you use in getting your information, okay? Because I check the references, okay? I check the references. And so when I uh, use a reference and I find out that uh, what you're saying is not what is in your reference, I, I, I'll, I'll give you a zero or a one just to appreciate the fact that you submitted okay and then if you also submit uh late i would subtract your marks so, okay commensurate to the total mark okay other important uh announcements i will give them at the end of the the lecture so we looked at the factors so we looked at the mechanisms of protection of a gastric mucosa please make sure you you know that okay and i gave you assignments yesterday i forgot the, the assignments um uh, the class reps, please, uh, class reps for both Biomed and uh, MBCHP, please make sure you message me the the, the, the compendium of the, assi the, assi the assignment. You understand? You message me the assignment so that I, I put them in the uh, Google Classroom. And, okay. And uh, the essence of the assignment is not a copy and paste for me. Please, I, I don't appreciate that. I try as much as I can to give you short assignments so that within you it's within the contents of your lecture material. Okay. Okay. So today we'll continue and then briefly we'll look at um, pepsinogen secretion, pepsinogens. We mentioned that when we talked about the cells in the in the gastric mucosa, we talked about especially with especially in the, um, the body and the antrum. Excuse, please. We talked about um, um, the 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 osynthetic cells or the pari the parietal cells which produce hydrochloric acid and uh, and um, intrinsic factor. Then we also talk about um, the the zymogen cells, the chief cells or the peptic cells that produce um, um, pepsinogens. Okay, and other forms of enzymes, the gastric lipase and the gelatinase, and uh, okay, and we talked about the the G cells in the pyloric antrum that produce the gastrin, and we also mentioned about the TG cells in the duodenal mucosa that produces um, uh, duodenal uh, that produce gastrin. Okay, or okay, and then we also mentioned that we had other cells in the duodenal mucosa that produces. Uh, gastric inhibitory peptide, which, which I also mentioned that it was formerly called enterogastron, okay? So we have two types of pepsinogens that are produced. We have pepsin-1 and pepsin-2, and they are produced from the peptic cells, or so the chief cells of the gastric mucosa. And then um, these pepsinogens are, 
they differ they differ immunohistochemically okay the cells are the cells that produce these ones or well, they they differ okay and then um this uh these pepsinogens remember they are produced within the cells and, and then they are uh, they are they are they are stored in uh, in in uh, what we call zymogen granules and are secreted by exocytosis and then the, the release of pepsinogens is uh, stimulated by what we call sec secretagogues okay you see Secretagogues, okay. These are chemicals that stimulate the secretion of substances, okay. So we have uh, secretagogues that stimulate acid secretion, okay. Example of these secretagogues are gastrin, histamine, and acetylcholine. So these pepsinogens, uh, the release of the pepsinogens from the zymogen granules by the process of exocytosis is stimulated by secretagogues, okay. And examples of these are uh, acetylcholine. A histamine and gastrin. Okay, these are these are secretagogues. Okay, that stimulate the production of what of gastric acid. Okay, and now remember that the the remember that the the, the pepsinogens are components of the gastric secretion. Okay, so we are just we are just starting and we are talking about pepsinogen secretion, and so. I would say we have two types of we have two types of pepsinogens. We have pepsinogen one and pepsinogen two, and they are produced from the peptic cells, and they are produced and stored in zymogen granules in these cells and, ex and excreted or secreted, sorry, secreted by what by uh, exocytosis. And what is the stimulus for their secretion? The stimulus for their secretion is by secretagogues. Okay, their their release is 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 uh is stimulated by secretagogues okay and we'll talk about that in detail and these are what are the examples of the secretagogues uh-huh gastrin histamine and acetylcholine okay these pepsinogens that are produced they are produced in inactive form okay and that's what we mentioned yesterday one of the, and one of the reasons we mentioned that they are produced in inactive form is that they should this, this prevents auto digestion of the gas uh the, the the gastric walls or the gastric mucosa okay so they they are produced uh, in inactive form so that they shouldn't eat up they, since the, 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 the tissues are proteinous in nature and these enzymes are protein enzymes they shouldn't eat up what they shouldn't eat up the tissues okay so they are producing what in inactive forms okay they are producing inactive forms okay but how are they activated they are activated by hydrochloric acid okay they are activated into pepsins by what by hydrochloric acid so pepsinogens are activated to pepsins by what by hydrochloric acid Okay, pepsins are the active forms of what of pepsinogens. Okay, the pepsinogens are produced from the peptic cells in inactive forms. Okay, and they are activated by what hydrochloric acid. So when this hydrochloric acid activates the pepsinogen to pepsin, some of the pep the pepsin that has been formed also goes back to activate more pepsinogen to pepsin. So we call it what auto activation. Okay, so active pepsins also help in the activation of pepsinogens to what to pepsins okay so pepsins are what are proteolytic enzymes which start the digestion of what of this we start protein digestion okay they start protein digestion okay they start what they start protein digestion so they are they all they are called their endopeptidases okay they that they break down protein molecules into peptones proteoses and polypeptides okay they they are endopeptidases i'm sure I don't know if you've done a protein metabolism, okay, exopeptidases and what endopeptidases, and we'll look at that. Of course, most of the, the proteases in the released by the pancreas are also what you have exopeptidases from inside, and they break down protein molecules, complex protein molecules into peptones, proteoses, uh, uh, polypeptides, okay? And their optimum pH of activity is 1.6 to 3.2. Okay, so their optimum pH of activity is 1.6 to 1.3.2. So that is that about pepsinogens secretion. 
And let's look at the mechanism of hydrochloric acid formation. If you want to know about more about uh, understanding the pathophysiology of peptic ulcers, you will need to know about the physiology of uh, hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay, that is fundamental. Okay, if you would need to understand the pathophysiology of peptic ulcer, you would need to know the physiology of gastric acid secretion or hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay, and we said yesterday that hydrochloric acid is formed from the ozintic cells or from what? From the, um, from the parietal cells, okay? And these uh, cells contain large number of mitochondria and you can imagine what mitochondria, the purpose of mitochondria, of course, for energy, as well as a, a, a system of canaliculi through which hydrochloric acid is synthesized and is fed into the lumen of the gas of the stomach or into the gastric lumen, okay? Now, let me discuss to you the steps in the formation, involved in the formation of what? Of hydrochloric acid. Quite an interesting process. Uh, I don't know if you have, if you've had time to, to read the previous notes and look at the, the diagram of the stomach and then the gastric mucosa and in the gastric mucosa we have glands and these glands have cells. And so one of the cells is what? the ozintic cells or the parietal cells. So the formation of hydrochloric acid is within this parietal cell. So we have the apical surface and we have the basolateral or the basal surface. So we have the apical membrane, which is towards the gastric lumen, and we have the basal membrane, okay, or the basal surface, okay, or the basolateral surface, okay? So we have the apical, which is towards the gastric lumen, and we have what? The basal surface. Okay, so inside the cell, there, there, is, there is metabolism going on, and the, a, a, a product of metabolism is carbon dioxide. Okay, so the carbon dioxide formed during cellular respiration within the parietal cells combines with water. Okay, Carbo this carbon dioxide combines with water to form what? Uh, carbonic acid. Okay, and this reaction is slow, but it is hastened, catalyzed by an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Okay, this, is a, this should be the second time um, we are talking about carbonic anhydrase. We, we mentioned it in, uh, in respiration, right? Okay, we, we, in, in the same process. So carbon dioxide combines with water, forming carbonic acid. Okay, and this carbonic acid is formed rapidly uh, by the activity of an enzyme called what? Um, carbonic anhydrase enzyme. Okay, and this carbonic anhydrase enzyme is abundant within the parietal cells. Okay, so this carbonic acid that is formed dissociates into what? Into halogen ion and bicarbonate. What are we discussing? We are discussing the formation of what? Hydrochloric acid. Okay, so we have hydrogen ion and chloride ion. We are discussing the formation of what hydrochloric acid from where? From the parietal cells or the ozintic cells that are present within the gastric mucosa. So I said, these ozintic cells or the parietal cells have the, the apical surface and what? The basal surface. The apical surface is to, it's to the lumen, isn't it? And the, and the basal surface is, is to the ECF or to the blood vessels that are ferrying things, okay? Or oh, the, the uh, of course, or the, the basal surface, it's it's too towards the submucosa. Let's put it in that perspective. And there we also have what small blood vessels, right? And so I said the how is um, how is hydrochloric acid formed? The uh, the carbon dioxide that is produced during cellular respiration combines with water. Okay, the carbon dioxide that is formed during cellular respiration combines with water. And this uh, form gives us carbonic acid. This reaction is slow, but by the aid of the carbonic anhydrase enzyme, it is rapid. And this carbonic anhydrase enzyme is abundant in the parietal cells. 
Okay, so we have carbonic and ice, carbonic acid that is formed from the reaction of carbon dioxide and water. This carbonic acid dissociates into a bicarbonate and hydrogen ion. Okay, this hydrogen ion, this um, carbonic acid dissociates into what? Hydrogen ion and what? Bicarbonate. What happens? Hydrogen ion is pumped into the lumen of the canaliculi. Remember, canaliculi, they are like, canal, they are like canals. So it is pumped into the canaliculi. Okay, so you have the parietal cells, which has contains a, a, a well-developed canalicular system. So from the parietal cells, the, the, the hydrogen ion is pumped into the canaliculi. Okay, as it is pumped into the canaliculi, the true what we call the hydrogen potassium, hydrogen ion potassium ATP, potassium is pumped into the cell. Okay, so this is a this is an active process. Energy is used. Okay, so you have the hydrogen potassium, hydrogen ion potassium ion ATP. Okay, the hydrogen ion that is formed from the dissociation of carbonic acid is pumped from inside the cell into the canaliculi. As it is pumped uh, into the canaliculi, potassium from the canaliculi from the ECF is pumped is pumped into the what into the parietal cell. So this is an antiporter. Okay, this is an what this is an antiporter. It's, an, it's a what a hydrogen potassium exchanger, so to speak. Okay, but this, this is a pump. It's pumping hydrogen ion outside and what potassium inside. Please follow. Okay, so this is what this is an uh, an antiporter. Mm -hmm. Okay, now and then what happens? The bicarbonate is is what is extruded is sent out into the interstitial fluid. Okay, the bicarbonate is exchanged is sent to the interstitial fluid in exchange of chloride. So how the chloride bicarbonate exchanger? Okay, uh, I, I'm taking it slowly because I would have been showing it in a diagram form. So we have. Uh, hydrogen ion inside the parietal cell is pumped into the canaliculi. Okay, in exchange of what? In exchange of bicarbonate. Okay, so the hydrogen ion is where it's out and bicarbonate is inside the cell. Okay, but then this bicarbonate is pumped into the interstitial uh, fluid in exchange of what? Chloride. So chloride now moves into the cell. Okay. Yes, chloride now moves into the cell. Then from the cell, chloride now diffuses into what? Chloride now diffuses into the canaliculi. Okay, in the canaliculi, chloride now combines with hydrogen ion to give you what? Hydrochloric acid. Okay. Now, what keeps, if you see, you can, we, we can see, remember the sodium potassium ATP is right? Where it pumps out sodium and brings in what? Potassium. Okay, so the sodium potassium ATP keeps the intracellular sodium concentration low by pumping out sodium and what? Pumping out sodium into the interstitial fluid and pumping in potassium into the cell. Okay, so we, of course, we are familiar with the function of what the sodium potassium ATP is. So now, when the sodium potassium ATP is pumps sodium out into the interstitial fluid and pumps potassium in, what happens? It creates a gradient. It, 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 the concentration of potassium inside the cell increases. And when this potassium increases, it, it, it favors, okay? It, it favors the, the exchange with what? With both hydrogen ion and sodium, okay? So we, we need to understand that dynamics. We need to understand that dynamics, okay? Okay, then there's what we also talk about is what we call the postprandial alkaline tide. The postprandial alkaline tide. Post alkaline tide. You need to know that. Postprandial alkaline tide. Okay. So when gastric secretion increases after a meal, we saw that bicarbonate is exchanged for chloride. So bicarbonate is sent into the interstitial fluid, and which is picked up by what? By the venous system. Okay. So we now see that bicarbonate is added into what? Into the blood by the parietal cells. And what happens with the pH of the systemic blood? The pH of the systemic blood is slightly increased and the urine is, becomes alkaline. 
Okay, so this effect is called what? The post prandial alkaline tide, the pH as well as alkalinity of the urine following what? In, uh, in, in gas secretion, the pH of the systemic blood slightly increases and the urine um, acid in the blood. Okay, so that is very, that is very vital. You take note of that. You take note of that. Then you have, um, let's look at the control of hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay, we've looked at this. So let's look at the control of hydrochloric acid secretion, the control of hydrochloric acid secretion. We've just talked about how hydrochloric acid is formed. We've looked at a uh, post prandial alkaline type. So let's look at the control of hydrochloric acid secretion. What are the factors that inhibit its secretion and what are the factors that stimulate its secretion? So we have inhibitory factors and we have stimulatory factors. Okay. If we saw yesterday, remember we mentioned that even when the food enters the duodenum, there, there are some, there is a distension of the duodenum. Actually, when the acidity of the, the chine, it will lead to release of certain uh, substance, certain hormones that inhibit gastric acid secretion. Okay, we mentioned uh, CCK, we mentioned secretin, we mentioned VIP, and we mentioned what? GIP. I said prospanda alkaline tide. This is the effect of gastric acid secretion, increased gastric acid secretion following a meal. So after you, you take a meal, the gastric acid secretion increases. And by, by consequence, we mentioned earlier that during the process of hydrochloric acid formation, carbonic acid is released, is what is extruded into the interstitial fluid. Okay, and of course, this is part of the ECF and will be picked up and it would uh, uh, get into the blood. So the systemic pH slightly increases due to the increase in the amount of bicarbonate. Okay, due to the increase in the amount of bicarbonate. So the, uh, the, the, the pH slightly increases and the pH of blood size increases. And then also the urine becomes slightly alkaline, becomes more alkaline. Okay, due to what? The uh, uh, increased amounts of bicarbonate in the systemic circulation as a result of what? Uh, increase uh, gastric acid secretion. Okay, so the parietal cells release more bicarbonate into the blood. Okay, so uh, prosper, I think that uh, that is, that is the explanation, okay? And then so, you can now, okay, we are, looking, we are talking about control of hydrochloric acid secretion. So we have inhibitory factors and stimulatory factors. So we have the inhibitory factors, which we have certain gastrointestinal hormones like cholecystokine, intestinal polypeptide, and gastric uh, inhibitory polypeptide. Okay, then we have the enterogastric reflex, the, uh, the excitement I gave you yesterday, the enterogastric reflex, okay, where the uh, presence of uh, food in the duodenum and uh, certain chemicals in the, ir irritate the duodenal mucosa, causing distension and leading to local reflex, prevertebral gangrene reflex, and uh, the long uh, central reflexes, okay. And I gave you an assignment to look at, to talk on the enterogastric reflex. Okay, so, and the enterogastric reflex is a reflex that inhibits gastric acid secretion due to entry of gastric content into the intest small intestines. Okay, there is uh, entry of gastric content into the small intestine provokes what? Um, the enterogastric reflex leading to what? Inhibition of gastric acid secretion. Okay, they also have prostaglandins. Okay, prostaglandins. We talked yesterday about this, the formation of prostaglandins from membrane phospholipids through arachidonic acid and either in uh, giving us uh, prostaglandins, especially, and I said the, input, the, the focus of that was prostaglandin E, okay? We have thromboxane in platelets, we have uh, prostacycline in, um, in the vascular endothelium. Here we have prostaglandin E too, 
okay, prostaglandin E. And we saw one of the functions of the prostaglandin was what? For microcirculation within the gastric mucosa. We said it also stimulates microsecretion, and we, and we mentioned that also it, it inhibits what? Uh, gastric acid secretion. Okay, it inhibits gastric acid secretion. So please begin to put these facts together. When we come to peptic ulcer, we see how they all and how aspirin will be able to predispose someone to ulcers. Okay, so you can now see one of the inhibitory factors for gastric acid secretion is what is prostaglandins, especially what prostaglandin E2. Okay, and what, how do they act? They act by decreasing intracellular cyclic AMP levels. Okay. Okay, they act by decreasing intracellular cyclic AMP levels. Okay, so let's look at stimulatory factors. Stimulatory factors. When we started discussing about pepsinogens, I told you about secretagogues. Okay, secretagogues. Okay, these are chemical substances that stimulate acid secretion. Okay, they stimulate acid secretion. And we, I mentioned them had his acetylcholine, histamine, and what gastrin. Okay, they have we had acetylcholine, histamine, and what gastrin. Okay. So let's look at acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is released by the uh, postganglionic cholinergic fibers. Okay, they are released by postganglionic cholinergic nerve endings, and they act by binding to M1 muscarinic receptors. Okay, they act by binding to what M1 muscarinic receptors, and when they bind to M1 muscarinic receptors the cause uh, increase intracellular calcium, okay? And uh, this will lead to, to, to acid secretion, okay? Okay, and so the bind, acetylcholine here binds what the M1 muscarinic receptor. And so for us to inhibit this process, you can use what? Uh, a cholinergic blocker. An example of it is what? Atropine. Okay, so if you use atropine, it will block this. But then we'll see, of course, when you come to pharmacology, we'll tell you why atropine is not the best. It has, also has other side effects, okay? So we have, then the next secret agog is histamine, okay? Histamine. Histamine is released from enterochromaffin-like cells, okay, and mass cells, okay? They, they are continuously released in small amounts by cells in the in the gastric mucosa called the enterochromaffin-like cells, okay? They, they, they resemble mast cells, so they are enterochromaffin-like cells, and they release uh, histamine. And what does histamine do? Histamine binds to H2 receptors, okay? H2 receptors in the gastric uh, mucosa, okay? Or in the parietal cells, or in the parietal cells in the gastric mucosa. So it binds to H2 receptors, okay? And how... When it binds to H2 receptors, it increases the intracellular cyclic AMP levels. Okay, so H2 uh, histamine binds to H2 receptors in the parietal cells and uh, stimulate the production of gastric acid by, by increasing intracellular cyclic AMP levels. We said prostaglandin acts by decreasing intracellular cyclic AMP levels, thereby antagonizing the effect of histamine. And this histamine is continuously released uh, by the enterochromaffin-like cells in the gastric mucosa. Okay? So it's quite important. Okay, so that is... And so, and the, uh, the product, the action of histamine is inhibited by an H2 blocker called cymetidine. For some of you, probably maybe you have been having gastric ulcers, probably maybe you go to the hospital, sometimes they give you what? Cymetidine, okay? Cymetidine, okay? Cymetidine. So then um, you have the next secretor gok is what? Gastrin, okay? Gastrin, and okay, there are this, I remember that we mentioned gastrin is produced from what? From the G cells, okay? From the G cells. And it reaches the, the, the stomach via bloodstream and it acts by binding to some special gastrin receptors. Okay. Act by binding to some special gastrin receptors and increases what? Intracellular calcium levels, just like acetylcholine. Okay. So we've mentioned uh, factors that 
are able to stimulate production of uh, gastric acid. So we've mentioned acetylcholine, we've mentioned histamine, we've mentioned gastrin, okay? All of these act on the pareto cells, okay? But we have other factors that we inhibit like uh, secretine, cholecystokinin, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, gastric inhibitory peptide, and then we have the enterogastric reflex that what inhibits gastric acid secretion, okay? But you have to understand that histamine plays a facilitative role. It's, it's a necessary cofactor, okay? It, it facilitates the actions of acetylcholine and gastrin, but itself produces very little uh, effect in the secretion of hydrochloric acid. So histamine is seen upon as what? As a necessary gastric acid secretion. All these three factors must act, should act uh, simultaneously. So what we call the multiplicative effect. When histamine is acting, gastrin is acting, uh, acetylcholine is acting, we can have what? Uh, we have um, a great amount of uh, hydrochloric acid that is produced, okay? Then we can look at, um, there is also, uh, well, let's look at the relation between hydrochloric acid and gastrin secretion. Okay, we look at the relation between hydrochloric acid and gastrin secretion. Okay, we have, there is a negative feedback relation between hydrochloric acid secretion and the rate of liberation of the gastrin hormone. Okay, so if we have an increased hydrochloric acid secretion inhibits the liberation of gastrin and vice versa. So, so such, such a relation is important as an autoregulatory mechanism for hydrochloric acid secretion. And then it protects the gastric mucosa from damage that will occur if the acid is secreted in excessive amounts. So gastrin stimulates the production of hydrochloric acid. And when the level of hydrochloric acid, when the uh, 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 amount of hydrochloric acid produced is increasing, it inhibits gastrin secretion. Okay, we'll come to hormones of the gastrointestinal system towards the end of the, the course. Okay, and we'll talk in detail. Okay, so let's look at mechanisms of decreasing excessive gastric acidity. What are the mechanisms by which the, the GIT decreases excessive gastric acidity? Okay, the, we have just talked about what is the inhibition of release of gastrin by a negative feedback. That means when the acidity of the, uh, of the stomach is increasing, when I say that when the acidity is increasing, it means when the pH is decreasing, okay, very much, okay, the, it will uh, inhibit what? Release of gastrin. And when a gastrin is inhibited, the amount of uh, hydrochloric acid produced will be, will be, will be reduced, okay? Then uh, another mechanism of decreasing excessive gastric acidity Remember, this is different from uh, factors that inhibit gastric acid secretion per se, but then there are, in addition to those factors that inhibit gastric acid secretion, we also have increased secretion of thick mucus. okay? This neutralizes the hydrochloric acid, okay? In addition to the factors that inhibit gastric acid secretion, we have also what? Uh, in, uh, increased secretion of thick mucus. And then when the acid, when the excess acid reaches the duodenum, what happens? We talk about the enterogastric reflex, and we talk about what? The production of uh, hormones that inhibit gastric secretion. CCK, that's cholecystokinin, vasoactive intestinal polypeptide, uh, gastric inhibitory peptide, and secretine. Okay, these are all uh, hormones that are produced, okay, from the duodenum because of what excess acidity reaching the duodenum, okay? Now, of, of more importance is the reduction of duodenal acidity. Remember, one of the things is that since the duodenal mucosa is much more delicate than the gastric mucosa and, and develops ulcers more easily, okay? So, So the uh, first short assi assignment for today, why is the duodenal mucosa more susceptible
to developing authors than the gastric mucosa. Okay, why is the duodenal mucosa more susceptible in developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? Then class rep, please, the assignment I gave to you, to you, to the class yesterday, those short, short assignments, and I said it, all of them, there are four, they shouldn't be more than three quarters of a page. And please copy them out and send them to me, okay? Together with the few ones will be, who I'll send out today. They are just short, short things, please, okay? And they are the things I've mentioned within the class, within the lecture. Okay, but then you make sure you, when you study, you use peer review journals. So go to PubMed and you search journals and you read about those things. Okay, this is to also educate you on researching material and also reading literature that is relevant. Okay, so that's quite important. Okay, that's quite important. Okay. So I was saying that of importance is the reduction of the duodenal acidity because uh, in decreasing this gastric excess ga gastric acidity, we are protecting the duodenal mucosa, which is more delicate than um, than the gastric mucosa. Okay, so excessive duodenal acidity is decreased uh, by certain defensive mechanisms. Okay, there are certain defensive mechanisms that protect the 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 duodenum from the excess acidity that is coming from the from the stomach. Okay. Who can give us the first? Let's, we've talked about them in, in different formats. Okay, uh, why is the duodenal mucosa more susceptible to, to, to developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? That's the question. Somebody is asking for a repetition. Okay, then, so I'm, I'm not saying that, okay, the excessive duodenal acidity, that means the mechanism by which the duodenum protects itself from the excess acid of the stomach. What are they? We've discussed them in one way or the other, even today. So what are they? Can somebody help us? I've just discussed many of them just now. So what are they? Beautiful. Amy Joseph, yeah, that's wonderful. The enterogastric reflex, not enterogastron reflex, okay? That's enterogastric reflex. That's, that's, that's important. That's very beautiful, okay? The enterogastric reflex. And what did we say about it? Okay, this is uh, entry or entry of uh, gastric acid contents into the duodenum leads to a distension, a stretching, okay? As well as the chemical contents, uh, uh, excess acids and fats, into the into the duodenum uh, stimulates certain chemical receptors and brings about what reflexes and these reflexes are local axonic reflex the prevertebral and what and um, and um, the, the the central reflexes okay beautiful uh, and so this also leads to what secretions of what GIP CCK that's a ribbon that's great okay. Okay, that's that, yeah. And so one of the things is that this, uh, this enterogastric reflex and the release of GIP and uh, secretin and CCK, one, one of the things they do is that they delay gastric emptying, okay? They delay gastric emptying. They delay gastric em emptying and reduce gastric hydrochloric secretion. Okay, that's beautiful. Uh, Ruben and uh, Joseph. So they delay gastric empty and they reduce what? Gastric and hydrochloric acid secretion. Okay? So the amount entering the duodenum is decreased. Okay? And then in addition, secretin stimulates pancreatic and bile secretion. Secretin stimulates what? Pancreatic and bile secretion. Okay? And this pancreatic and bile secretion are rich in what? They are rich in bicarbonate. Uh, bicarbonate which now neutralizes what hydrochloric acid in the duodenum, okay? The what, the, the pancreatic and bile secretion, they are rich in what? They are rich in, 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 in bicarbonate and they neutralize what the hydrochloric acid, 
Okay? Yes. And then uh, Shellac says, increase mucus secretion in the duodenum. That's beautiful. Increase after that. The next point, increase mucus secretion in the duodenum by some glands we call what? The Brunner's glands. Okay? There are some glands we call what? The Brunner's glands. Okay, yeah, that's beautiful. Lucky says increase mucus secretion by the Brunner's glands. Okay, that's that's yeah, yeah that's great, Lucky. Yes, Rafi. So that, those are the points we've mentioned. Okay, so increase mucus secretion by what the Brunner's glands. That's that's beautiful. Okay, then we have regurgitation of excess acid back into the stomach. Okay, so please look. Uh, the first point which you mentioned was the enterogastric reflex and the secretion of uh, certain hormones. Okay, CCK, VIP, GIP, which um, delays gastric emptying and reduces gastric acid secretion. And we delay to stimulate the production of what? Of uh, pancreatic and bile. Uh, uh, secretions, okay, and these are rich in what bicarbonate and help in neutralizing. Okay, that's that's so beautiful. Uh, can somebody help Lazarus to? Can some uh, can somebody help Lazarus to address his question? Okay, we've passed that, but then somebody within the who was listening to me can just quickly answer that on that platform. He's asking if I should kindly repeat the relationship between hydrochloric acid and, uh, uh, and gastric secretion. No, gastrina. Gastrin secretion, not gastric secretion. Gastrin. Okay, gastrin. So somebody can address that. So we are looking at we are looking at the functions of hydrochloric acid. Okay, what are the functions of hydrochloric acid? Okay. One of the things is that it uh, activates pepsinogens into pepsins, right? And this start uh, protein uh, digestion and provides an optimum pH for the action. I remember asking this question last year and somebody splitted this one answer into three. Mm -hmm. uh, so you uh, activate pepsin. The next one was, um, the next one was, uh, he says, uh, starts putting that all of them are in one, okay? Uh, Lazarus, hope you are looking at the answers given by the students. They are correct. Joshua says, increases increase in hydrochloric acid secretion, decreases gastric secretion, that's okay. The same thing with uh, Molly, the same, okay? IV, and then Joseph, they are saying the same thing, and then and, and vice versa, okay? And vice versa. So that's beautiful. It shows you're following, okay? So... The first function of hydrochloric acid is that why it activates pepsinogens into pepsins. Okay, activate pepsinogens into pepsins. Uh, mindset shifters. Did you say the hormones e.g. VIP delay gastric emptying? Yes, they delay gastric emptying. Okay. Okay. So the the, the the points are within there. All the this, what the what the students are giving are actually in in, uh, in 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 tandem with what we discussed. And then auto regulatory mechanism. That's beautiful, Wison. That's 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 beautiful. There's a negative feedback auto regulatory mechanism protecting what also the the gastric mucosa. That's beautiful. So the second the second function of hydrochloric acid is what it kills most ingested bacteria. Okay, leading to sterilization of the stomach. Okay. Now, now you can now see why in, 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 in individuals who have low gastric acidity, when the gastric acidity is low, that means when the pH is higher, they are prone to enteritis, isn't it? To gastroenteritis. For example, in infants, okay, infants, there is a greater liability of what? Of gastroenteritis. Okay. Why? Because they are, the acidity of the stomach in these individuals in infants is low. Therefore, their stomach is not mostly sterilized, okay? It's not mostly sterilized, okay? So that is quite important. So the second function of hydrochloric acid is that it kills most ingested bacteria. The first, it activates pepsinogens to pepsin, which starts protein digestion. And how does it do it? It also provides an optimum pH for the action of pepsins, okay? And the pepsins act within a, an optimum pH of 1.6 to 3.2.
Samuel say he read that CCK is what stimulates the release of bi. I said secretin, 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 secret stimulates the release of uh, of bi. And we talk, we'll come to cholecystokinin. Cholecystokinin actually is is it, very important in the in the in the in the release as well as the contraction of the gallbladder. We'll come to that. So hearing of gastrin doing that. Uh, I don't know. Did we mention about gastrin doing that? I mentioned. I said secretin uh, stimulates pancreatic and bile secretion. Okay, secretin and stimulate bile secretion. Okay, I said secretin, but we can't rule out the fact of gas. I didn't mention gastrin, but then we'll look at uh, the functions of gastrin uh, shortly or probably close to the end of the, 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 the course. But I mentioned secretin, right? I'm sure Ivy is saying no. I'm sure she means no, that I, it wasn't gastrin. I said secretin, okay? I don't know if you have clear somewhere. Okay, so I was talking about the functions of hydrochloric acid. So the first one activates pepsinogens into pepsin. The second is kills most ingested bacteria. So it leads to sterilization of the stomach. So if there is a, okay, champion says I said secretin, so and it's okay, okay, okay. Chloric acid stimulates what? Bile flow and pancreatic acid secretion and pancreatic secretion, okay? And so how does it do this? It does this by stimulating the production of CCK and secretin from the duodenal mucosa, okay? So the first function activates pepsinogens into pepsin. The second function, it kills most ingested bacteria. Please, if I ask you to give me the functions of hydrochloric acid, don't just state that it kills most ingested bacteria and end there, okay? It does it by sterilizing with, uh, uh, the stomach, okay, leading to sterilization of the stomach. So, and then he said the, third, the fourth function, it, ca it causes milk cuddling. It cuddles milk, okay? It helps milk digestion, keeping milk in the stomach for a long time, okay? It cuddles milk, okay? And this, this is... Um, this is brought by renin, okay? I mentioned yesterday that re renin is a, uh, it's, it's a, it's a chemical substance, uh, more or less like a chemical substance that helps in cuddling milk, okay? And I said it's mostly present in, 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 in animals. So the question is, what helps in cuddling milk in animals? In, in humans, what helps milk cuddling in humans? Okay, that's a, the that's a second question. So let's continue. Okay, then the fifth function is that it helps absorption of iron by converting ferric iron to ferrous iron. Okay, it helps absorption of iron by con converting ferric iron to ferrous iron. Okay, it also helps absorption of calcium by preventing the pre precipitation of calcium salts. Okay, so it helps in the absorption of iron and calcium. Okay, it also regulates gastric emptying together with other factors. Okay, so how does hydrochloric acid regulate gastric emptying? Please, how, how does hydrochloric acid regulate gastric emptying? We've discussed that, but then I want to see here it brought back again. How does hydrochloric acid regulate gastric emptying? I thought the, the answers would be popping like popcorn. Okay. Okay, uh, the answer, how does hydrochloric acid regulate gastric emptying? I 
I'm watching for the answer. Okay, Justin says it's true enterogastric reflex. Okay, and that means uh, the entry of acidic content in uh, the, 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 the acidic chime into the duodenum brings about the enterogastric reflex. What again? We've talked about it just briefly. What again? I'm waiting for the answer, please, so that we proceed. Okay, uh, Kaoma says hyaluronic acid. This acidity in the stomach which increases secretion. Now, that's correct. But the starting is not appropriate. It is when this acidic content reaches the duodenum, the duodenal mucosa. Well, when it reaches the duodenal mucosa, it is when secretin and CCK are released, and this really bring about gas, delayed and gas renting. Okay. So how, okay, uh, yeah, donors, okay, because I, I know gastrin is also important in a way in gastric emptying. Okay, uh, okay, now one of the things which of, of course are the answers are coming great, but uh, never summarize too much an answer that can summarize the facts, okay? And always give the facts uh, in a physiological manner. So the answers are correct. And then don't forget about the function of gastric inhibitory polypeptide. Okay. The function of gastric inhibitory polypeptide. That's beautiful. That means when we would look at the hormones detailed later on. So now we want to look at peptic ulcer, the physiology of peptic ulcer. The physiology of peptic ulcer. So what peptic ulcer? Uh, this is an erosion, a loss of an area in the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract. Okay, and this is an erosion, a loss of an area in the mucosa of the gastrointestinal tract that occurs due to an auto digestion by gastric juice. Okay, it occurs by auto digestion by gastric juice. Okay, and it is most common in the first part of the duodenum, less common in the stomach. But where it occurs greater, more, most in the lesser curvature. Remember, I told you yesterday about the greater curvature and the lesser curvature, where we had the the, the constriction between the antrum and the and the and the body, where we had the incisura angularis. Also, there at the lesser curvature is more prone. Okay, and um, and it is it is it is least common in the lower end of the esophagus. Okay, it is more common in the in the first part of the duodenum, less common in the stomach, but if it has to be in the stomach, it will be around the lesser curvature, but and the least common in the lower end of the esophagus. Okay, so what is the cause? What are the causes of peptic ulceration? Remember, we are dealing with physiology here. So we are looking at ulceration is primarily due to first. This is this is the basis. Any other thing builds up on this due to an imbalance between the rate of gastric secretion and the degree of mucosa protection against auto digestion so what we have is there is an imbalance okay ulceration ulceration of the git is primarily due to an imbalance between the rate of gastric secretion and the degree of mucosa protection against auto digestion if the rate of gastric acid secretion increases we are we are at risk of having an ulceration, and if the the mucosa protection against auto digestion decreases, we are at risk. Okay, so please remember the 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 mechanisms we dis discussed yesterday for 
protecting against auto digestion. Okay, the defensive mechanisms we discussed yesterday that are provided by the mucosa barrier. Okay, against uh, excessive acidity. So the imbalance between the rate of gastric acid secretion and the degree of mucosa protection against auto digestion can occur first. Let's look at excess gastric acid secretion. What are the things that can prone to excess gastric acid secretion? Because this is the main cause of 50% of cases of duodenal ulcers and some cases of gastric ulcers. So it may be due to what? One, hereditary factors. Okay, hereditary factors. Probably is hereditary that people have the tendency to produce more gastric acid. They have psychogenic factors. Okay, as you with stress, anxiety, or nervous tension. Remember we mentioned yesterday again, what are the factors that could um, stimulate gastric secretion? We mentioned about anxiety, stress. Okay, then you also have hypergastrinemia, what we call the El zolinga ellison syndrome. I'm sure you've done that in your pathology, zolinga ellison syndrome. Where we have, uh, this is caused by excess gastrin secretion from certain tumors in the in the stomach and the duodenum and some in the pancreas. We call them gastrinomas. Okay, you have tumors in the stomach, in the duodenum, and in the pancreas, and they secrete excess they secrete excess gastrin, and we know that gastrin stimulates the production. Instances where we have excessive exposure of the mucosa to normal gastric juice. Okay? Now, we have, we are looking at the causes of peptic ulcer. The first one is excessive gastric secretion. The second uh, med, uh, major subheading is excessive exposure of the mucosa to normal gastric juice. That means we have normal gastric juice, but then we are excessively exposed. It's been the mucosa is exposed, excessively exposed to it. And this is the main cause of the esophageal ulcers and some, and some cases of duodenal ulcers. Okay? This is the main cause of what? The esophageal ulcers and some cases of what? Duodenal ulcers. Okay? And that is what, for, for esophageal ulcers, it often occurs as a result of what? Gastroesophageal reflux, where we have uh, the lower end of the. Uh, of esophagus is uh, exposed to gastric acidity due to what frequent regurgitation of gastric juice. Okay, if we have incomp incompetence of the lower esophageal sphincter, we will be prone to what the to gastroesophageal reflux and uh, esophageal ulcers. So you are exposing, you are excessively exposing the mucosa to normal gastric juice. Okay. Okay, so uh, excessive exposure of the duodenal mucosa to gastric juice is basically due to deficiency of the defensive mechanisms and decreases duodenal acidity. And we mentioned the defensive mechanisms of the duodenum except, uh, against excess gastric acidity. acidity. Okay, so when, when, when there is a deficiency in those mechanisms, uh, will be prone to having what duodenal ulcers. Okay, then the, set, the third class is where you have disruption of the mucosa barrier. Disruption of the mucosa barrier. What if we the, our mucosa barrier is disrupted? And this is the main cause in most cases of gastric ulcers. In this case, hydrochloric acid is secreted. Uh, hydrochloric acid is secreted in normal amounts, but then the the gastric, the mucosa barrier is disrupted. Okay, it could occur due to one decreased mucus secretion or secretion of abnormal mucus that has lower protective effect than normal. So, we have decreased mucus secretion. We have uh, what could be what, what could be one of the reasons why there is a decreased mucus secretion? Can somebody quickly just say that? What could be one of the reasons why we have a decreased mucus secretion in the, in the stomach? Okay, while you are thinking and saying that, then the second thing that could break this barrier is what? Ex, 
okay? Uh, that, that is almost giving out the answer before. Okay, so what, uh, what could lead to um, decrease mucus secretion in the, in the stomach? Just quickly, please. Quickly. Destruction or what? Um, uh, Prosper, your, your answer didn't come out complete. Okay, I'm waiting for for the for the response. Beautiful, champion intake of aspirin that is prostaglandin promoter. So you have whatever will impede the production of prostaglandins in the gastric mucosa. That's beautiful. That's that's beautiful. So we've got the answer. Now, uh, if I ask such a question, Linus, okay, if you say prolonged intake of aspirin, that's 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 the starting. What does prolong? prolong uh, uh, intake of, uh, of of aspirin do it will lead to what decreased production of prostaglandin E2, which reduces what uh, mucus secretion. Because you have to link your answer your to the question. It must yeah aspirin. You take aspirin yes, it reduces prostaglandin production, and then uh, which decreases what uh, it decreases. Um, Mucus production, then destruction or injury to the brain as glands. Of course, this is this has to do with what with the uh, duodenal ulcers, right? That's beautiful. That's great thought. Okay, so that 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 that, that is that. Okay, so we talked about decreased mucus secretion. Then the second one will have excessive intake of gastric irritants, alcohol, vinegar, spices. Okay, you've had people probably maybe who are people who are uh, having gastric ulcers. They don't take things like spices food right because it, they are uh, irritants okay then you sometimes they don't even take alcohol of course you've heard that people with ulcers have been uh, 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 asked not to take alcohol right of course we've seen that alcohol directly stimulates gastric secretion then vinegar too and you see some of the people who say okay they want to they want to eat salads please hope your salad doesn't have your vegetable salad doesn't have vinegar you didn't put vinegar in the okay uh-huh in your cream, okay. So we may probably okay. Hope you didn't make your cream with vinegar. So things like that. So you see people are trying to protect themselves, and then you could also bile salts also irritate the gastric mucosa. Okay, bile salts also irritate the gastric mucosa. Bile salts also irritate the gastric mucosa. Okay. Then we've talked about in excessive intake of aspirin. Okay, and this irritate the gastric mucosa, or and also inhibits what. Synthesis of prostaglandins, which is which normally prevent what's affirmation. Okay. And we said the, 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 the prostaglandins also inhibit gastric acid secretion and antagonizes histamine. Okay. They also have infections, okay? Infection of the gastric mucosa by certain types of bacteria, okay, which may be associated with what? Atrophic gastritis, okay, which bacterium. Which bacterium has been linked with uh, gastric acid? Uh, Joseph, I, I want to think spices. One of the things is that they, beside the, irrita the, the, the irritation, remember that gastric acid secretion is also by uh, irritation when you have uh, chemical stimulation of the, uh, the receptors in the, in the mucosa activating the submucosa plexus this leads to what gastric acid secretion remember okay uh, one of the things i want to think so okay beautiful the first one is helicobacter pylori okay helicobacter pylori and the researcher which who is a, is a beautiful story this he eventually got a Nobel prize and uh he he went through a lot he had to he, he had to take in this bacterium to be able to Prove its causation and its link with peptic ulcer, and then treating himself. Okay, and then treating himself. Okay, it's a Helicobacter pylori. Okay. So having understanding of this, okay, looked at one of the physiology of the production of hydrochloric acid. Uh, because one of my questions, I don't know, I asked it last year, if I can remember. Uh, 
No, the, the other was during the supplementary, if I'm not mistaken. It's about uh, ba the basis of the basis of uh, the basis of uh, of of uh, peptic ulcer treatment. Okay, what is the pharmacological? What is the physiological basis for peptic ulcer treatment? Okay, what is the physiological basis? Now, so for whatever drug class of drug you are giving, you should have an understanding. Okay, so the treatment of peptic ulcer is based on protecting the mucosa barrier by avoiding excessive uh, smoking or intake of aspirin or other gastric irritants. Okay, and then by reducing Somebody asked a beautiful question here, and I will give it back. And then I've answered it in part, but I think there's more to that, okay? And I'll answer that, okay? Uh, let me see. Okay, I'll come to that at the end. So the treatment of peptic ulcer so it's based on protecting the mucosa barrier by avoiding excessive smoking and intake of aspirin or other gastric irritants. And then um, by also reducing gastric secretion and neutralizing gastric acidity. So what, in whatever treatment you are having, it is about balancing, remember? Okay, protecting the mucosa barrier against, by avoiding excessive uh, smoking intake of uh, aspirin and other gastric, gastric irritants and reducing gastric secretion and uh, neutralization of excess gastric acidity. So we can have medical treatment and you can have surgical treatment, okay? So let's talk about the medical treatment with reasons. Let's, let's pop it up, okay? What are the medical treatment for peptic ulcers? What are the medical treatments for peptic ulcers? I'll use my Okay, what are the what is what are the medical treatments, please? From the from from your understanding of the physiology which we've discussed, what are the medical treatments for peptic ulcers? Fast, fast, please. Let's 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 answers. Champions is and and now the more or less they would um, try to help to neutralize the acid. Okay, uh huh. So antacids, for example, example of antacids like aluminium hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, uh, calcium carbonate, magnesium tricyclate. Those are antacids. Okay, they antagonize. Okay, they don't decrease the acid production, but they antagonize it once they are produced. Okay, so antacids. Okay, so we have antacids, okay? Most of which contains aluminum hydroxide, magnesium hydroxide, calcium carbonate, magnesium tricylicate. So those are antacids. They antagonize the acid that is produced. And then beautiful, many people have mentioned of proton pump inhibitors. What are examples of proton pump inhibitors? Uh, Sibanda said omeprazole, okay? Omeprazole is an example. Okay, is it lanoprazole, okay? Those are what? Those are proton pump inhibitors. What do they do? They inhibit the proton pump. What is the name of the proton, the, the pump? What is the name of the proton pump, please? What is the name of the proton pump? What is the name of the proton pump? Be rest assured that what we're discussing, you either answer it in, in term two test or in sessionals. I can tell you that, and there's a lot from here, from just on peptic ulcers that I can, that I will ask and take it from here and link it to blood, take it from here and link it to many other things. Okay, so what is the proton pump we are talking of? So hyd the hydrogen potassium ATPs, that's beautiful, champion. That's hydrogen potassium ATPs, that's the proton pump we are talking of. Okay, so we've talked of um, antacids, we've talked of what, okay, uh, TISA says an antihistamines. Okay, antihistamines, antihistamines. Ruben, what you're giving is a, is, is, is a trade name, not a generic name. So if I ask you a question, for example, you, you talk about what? You give generic names, okay? Mm. 
you see, you, you, you give generic names, okay? So that, that's, that's the, I think that um, Prilosec, it's, it's, it's a trend name. Okay, you give generic names, okay? If I'm not, if I'm not confusing. Then I was talking about somebody mentioned anti Tisa mentioned antihistamines. Okay, anti what? Antihistamines, antihistamines, antihistamines. An example of them is what? Cimetidine, ranitidine, famotidine. So those are histamine. Those are, and you have to be specific. H two blockers. That's what Nelly said it right. H two blockers, H two inhibitors like cimetidine, ranitidine, because we also have H one blockers. Which are actually against what? Uh, against um, allergies and other things. Okay. Then we also have uh, M1 muscarinic blockers. Okay. You have atropine, you have pyrenzepine. Uh, that's, those are M1. That's beautiful. Somewhere, some anticholinergics like atropine, pyrenzepine. Those are M1 blockers. Okay. Those are M1 blockers. So you need to be uh, specific. You need to be. No, they need to be specific, okay? Even, even uh, ganglionic blockers or uh, neuromuscular junction blockers are anticholinergics, isn't it? But then, so you need to be specific, M1 blockers, and then you give the example, okay? They also want sedatives, okay? Sedatives, which help in relieving anxiety and uh, nervous tension. Have we also found out that people who are having gas ulcer, they take milk, okay? They take milk, right? Yeah, and so uh, this has been a controversy, and um, Okay, I will uh, look at that. That's a point I've just put. So, but then excessive intake of milk, and th that is on the basis of the fact that the proteins buffer gastric acidity and the fat in it inhibit gastric secretion. And we'll look at that. Then Shile, she's asking, what brings about gastrinomas? It's just like what brings about tumors or cancers. Okay, they could be provoked by irritants, could be uh, by abnormalities of, uh, of, uh, uh, Division, okay, yes. The the, the causes of, of 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 cancers are are, are, are are multifaceted, okay, okay. Yeah, baking soda. I think baking soda is an antacid, okay. So baking soda would uh, antagonize the acid that is produced. I remember even uh, let me not use the word prescribing, but recommending uh, individuals who have heartburns and so certain things like that for uh, to take uh, baking soda. It antagonizes the acid, okay? That's on the basis of the fact that what is strongly alkaline. So we may say, we may probably, maybe we may not say treat, but to relieve, okay? Maybe to relieve, okay? Some or maybe to relieve, okay? And I like, I like Googling about home, rem home remedies for many things, okay? Uh, home remedies for many things, okay? So then, well, then the surgical treatment we have gastric vagotomy, okay, uh, cutting the vega supply to the stomach. Does it make sense if we cut the vega supply to the stomach? Okay, please. I'm telling you. I, I hope that during the time I'm setting exams, my my mind is fresh and I'm sitting by the beach side and thinking straight. I'll be able to carve out many questions from what we've discussed today. Okay. So we have gastric vagotomy, and so, and I could ask you what will be the effect of bilateral vagotomy, or what will be the effect of gastrectomy. Okay, and so there are many things to look at. Okay, there are many things to look at. So, uh, uh, everything being equal, I want to assess you on many such short A equations. Okay, so we can also have removal of the gastrin secreting antramucosa. That is quite a delicate one. You are removing the 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 cells that secrete gastrin. From the antramucosa, we can also have combined vagotomy plus uh, uh, 
selective removal of what the antral mucosa, which is the commonest, because you can the nerve and you also remove what the casein secreting uh, cells from the antral mucosa and other things like that. Okay. So let's quickly look at functions of the stomach and we can call it a day. Functions of the stomach. Of course, that's first thing is storage of food. The next function is mixing food with the gastric juice. Okay, mixing food with the gastric juice. Then the third function is emptying of the chyme into the duodenum at a slow and steady state. Okay, we call it piecemeal evacuation. Okay, piecemeal evacuation. It's meal evacuation, okay? So it empties the time into the duodenum in a slow and steady state, call it piecemeal evacuation. That is at a rate that is optimal for intestinal digestion, okay? Remember, if you have uh, collie wobbles or uh, internal uh, uh, gastrointestinal rush, what you might simply want to put it in the form of diarrhea or increased gastric motility, there will be no time from in a slow and steady state to allow for digestion and absorption, okay? So that's the importance for what? For the piecemeal evacuation. So the, the fourth function is killing of bacteria, sterilizing the, 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 the stomach. There's also digestion of fats and proteins by the gastric lipase and pepsins. Then also have absorption of simple substances like water and alcohol. Okay, absorption of... Um, uh, simple something like water and alcohol. The creator is so magnificent in such a way that what if water had to take time to be absorbed? So when you're thirsty and thirsty from the stomach is quite important. And that, uh, of course, that goes again to alcohol is absorbed quickly. Of course, alcohol is fat soluble and it's abs absorbed quickly. That is why people who take alcohol start feeling even tipsy and drunk even while they are still on it. Okay. Then the another function is red blood cell formation. The stomach helps in red blood cell formation. Please, how let's talk about it. How does the stomach help in red blood cell formation? I remember asking this question during Viva in was it third year or the student was in third year? Yeah, was in third year. She said she doesn't know. I asked, I asked like four questions, basic fundamental question. What is the function of Smooth endoplasmic reticulum, I don't know. I mean, questions are, and sometimes it just wonders me if uh, the people dying in the hospital that were saying this coronavirus could probably be an uh, inability to comprehend fundamentals. Ignorance has a rippling effect. Ignorance has a rippling effect. So how does the stomach help in red blood cell formation? How does the stomach? Shellac, yes. Hydrochloric acid helps in iron absorption. That's beautiful. How does it help? Reducing iron three to iron two for absorption. What again? Via champion, via production of intrinsic factor, which is necessary for B, vitamin B12 absorption in the terminal ileum. Those are those are important. Those are important. Those are important uh, points. Okay. Then the next function is what it helps in initiating many reflexes. Okay. Uh, that beside controlling gastric functions, also regulate other functions. Okay. And we we'll look at them as we come. Then uh, there is a condition atrophy of the gastric mucosa is called Achillea gastrica. Okay, I remember I asked this question last year. Achillea gastrica. I think I asked it last year, even within the supplementary. Achillea gastrica. Yes, I said, uh, okay, what is it? Of course, this is atrophy of the gastric mucosa. And it is characterized by pernicious anemia. When there's atrophy of the gastric mucosa, that means the gastric mucosa is withered. Okay. Yeah. So if there is weed that you begin to think of what is produced from the gastric mucosa first, so there is perinitious anemia due to lack of intrinsic factor. 
we have weakly developed bones because hydrochloric acid will not be formed, which helps in calcium absorption. Okay, so we have weak bones. We also have susceptibility to gastritis due to absence of, of the bactericidal effect of hydrochloric acid. Okay. Okay, so with Achillea gastric digestion, will Achillea gastrica affect digestion? So this is atrophy of the gastric mucosa and is characterized by pernicious anemia due to lack of intrinsic factor, weakly developed bones due to lack of hydrochloric acid, which helps in calcium absorption, susceptibility to gastritis due to absence of the bactericidal effect of hydrochloric acid. So I now ask, um, how is digestion within this condition? I thought we'll be able to go a little bit far today, but then just let me keep it at this. Okay, we are gone. Okay. Now, uh, please, uh, the, this, this, okay, this uh, term ends on Friday, so we will not have lectures for two weeks. Okay, and we'll resume, you, have a, you will receive an official communication from the institution. But then, so, so you receive an official communication from the institution. And so this is our last lecture for this term. And then when we come next term, it will be speed, okay? It will be speed. So because next term you've got to, you've got to, uh, you've got to do either renal physiology or endocrine, we'll look at the two, and then you've got to do also nervous. But I think we may would likely do endocrine and nervous because those are two systems. It's unfortunate, unfortunately that the system here in our school doesn't permit us to even exhaust physiology. And it's, it's, it's appalling, it's appalling. Okay, we don't, we have, we don't go half of irrespective of half, but then I see always feel like I need to slow down to have students understand the things I'm teaching. So uh, we would, uh, would not uh, have classes, we'll have classes in, in, the four, in the fourth night, in the fourth night. And uh, so you would have at least two years before the sessionals. It's a matter of when and not if, as I said yesterday. So you have a CAs, okay? And the first term CA, I had set it, I had printed the questions. You second CA, which will comprise cardiovascular, comprise, uh, I agree that you, okay? So please uh, take note of that, okay? Or uh, assignment, uh, please, uh, these are the questions for assignment. Uh, these are the questions for assignment. I Before I mentioned assignment, my network was shaking, so I mentioned that you have at least two CAs, the term one test, which was, uh, I had already set, okay? I had already set the questions, and so they are available. So whether you'll be writing offline or online, you'll still write the same things that are set, okay? Multiple choice and short aces. And then you write test two subsequently, probably maybe a little bit distance from test one. And that will involve cardiovascular physiology and uh, gastrointestinal physiology and probably be any other system that we'll do and then before your sessionals. And so we would... Um, I'm, pre, I'm, I, I'm hoping that a material I'm putting together comes out in, in, in record time. It may be helpful. And please never compromise anything for your academics because uh, it is costly to repeat a, an academic year or to, to be resitting a bit, to be retaking a paper or retaking a course. It's not, it's not the best. So never be pound, penny wise, pound foolish. Okay. Do not be penny wise, pound foolish. So uh, I'm. In, in addition to the assignment I gave yesterday, please, class rep, uh, try to call the, the assignment and send to me. I'm adding a few. And my assignments are not, my, my answers are very factual. I'll say, okay, the first question for today is what helps me cuddling in humans? What helps me cuddling in humans? What helps me cuddling in humans? That's the first question for today. What helps me 
what helps milk cuddling in humans? Okay, then the second question is, why is the Dudena mucosa more susceptible to developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? Why is the Dudena mucosa more susceptible to developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? And then uh, a student asked a question which I, I, I started to answer, but I think uh, maybe you could research on that and let's see how far. So how does spices cause decreased mucus secretion in the stomach or in the, in the, in the gastrointestinal tract? In the, how does spices or how do spices, sorry, how do spices, how do spices cause decreased mucus secretion in the gastrointestinal tract? Okay. Then the last question, does milk help in peptic ulcer management or it exacerbates it or it aggravates it? Does milk help in uh, peptic ulcer management or it exacerbates it or it aggravates it? Okay, does milk help in peptic ulcer management or, or treatment or it exacerbates or aggravates it? Okay, any, any question, any, 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 any note for clarification? Any note for clarification? Okay, without which, uh, it's, um, it's great time and thanks for your, for listening. Uh, okay, the Frenchman says, bon vacances. Yes, you have term one and term two separate tests. Those are separate tests. By regulation, the school you have to have at least two before a before session. Mm -hmm. The first question, um, what helps milk cuddling? And actually, actually type the question, what helps milk cuddling in humans? What helps milk cuddling in humans? And then, why is the duodena mucosa more susceptible to developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? That's the second question. Okay. Why is the duodena mucosa more susceptible to developing ulcers than the gastric mucosa? The third question um, is decreased mucus secretion. Uh, in whatever format, uh, Christopher, whether PDF or Word is fine by me, okay? Because I, I don't have to download it. I just read it from the Google Classroom. I, anyway, I open it and I read, okay? So my, it's okay, whatever format is fine. Please, yeah. Uh, and always make sure you have a, a reference from a peer review journal for each assignment. Make sure you read the article. It will build up your, your understanding, okay? Au revoir et bon vacances, okay.